Another month means it's time for more old school PC Q&A. I asked if you had any questions and you gave me questions. I'm going to answer them. I've put links in the video description to all the time indexes uh, for all of the questions. So if you don't like a question, please feel free to skip to the next one. Uh, these videos can get kind of long. Uh, also, uh, if you want to skip around to the end or hang around to the end, uh, I have a minor announcement about uh, the future of this series and uh, this channel, so stick around for that. But until then, uh, let's answer some questions. Duke Nukem asks, My question is about Mini Prince. Anne Bross recreated the first level of Prince of Persia with ASCII characters. One screen is 13 by 5 characters. Is it possible to make a version that runs full screen? In other words, is it possible to tweak the 40 by 25 text mode to a 13 by 5 text mode on a CGA or VGA card? Uh, the answer, very quickly, is no. Um, but you can get a little closer. Uh, and before I show you, um, I recommend that you actually check out this cute little mini Prince uh, project. It's not so much a fully playable version of Prince of Persia as it is more a performance art project, but it's cute, so you should check it out. I'll have a link in the description. So, can you make a text mode so low res that it's 13 by 5 characters? Not if you want to maintain compatibility. And even then, it would be a stretch, pun intended. Uh, what you can do, however, is 40 by 25 text mode uses the 8 by 8 character cell matrix. You can tell VGA to use the 8 by 16 character matrix, and that will turn your 40 by 25 text mode into a 40 by 12, technically 12.5. Uh, you'll have half. You'll have half a line, so you can get it to 40 by 12. And uh, I will quickly go into DOSBox and start up Tweak and show you uh, what that would look like. I don't have a VGA system set up at the moment, but DOSBox X does a really good job of emulating VGA. So let's go ahead and use that to demonstrate what it is I'm talking about. And I'm going to be using a program called Tweak. Uh, if I could type correctly. And uh, Tweak was this wonderful program in the 1990s that allowed you to modify VGA registers and test out what those registers did. Many a Tweak mode was made with Tweak. If I choose the current 16-point uh, font text screen and display it, you'll see that it displays only just a traditional 80 by 25 text mode. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the 40 by 25 uh, text mode can be switched to use the 18, sorry, the 16 point font as well. So uh, if we load a prepared register set and then display the text screen, this is what it looks like. And uh, as you can see, you've got, uh, you've got 12 and a half rows, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and a half. That is roughly the best you can do on an actual VGA card to try to get the largest text font in text mode available. Andrew Jackson writes, are you able to perhaps do a section on branchless code? Uh, that question seems like it's worded a little weird. It was at the end of a long thread. So essentially, what is branchless code and why should anyone care? Uh, in today's superscalar processors with uh, multiple pipelines, pipelines that are very deep, branchless code is really important. Um, not as important on older processors, but certainly on new ones. Um, in an effort to uh, not have to wait on memory and uh, execute, uh, try to keep the CPU as busy as possible, uh, CPU execution pipelines um, are very deep. And whenever you have a compare and a branch, um, the CPU has to kind of predict where the branch is going to go. And uh, if it guesses correctly, execution usually continues flawlessly. If it guesses incorrectly, then it's there's a speed penalty. The cache could possibly be emptied and, and other factors. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on modern uh, CPU design. Um, but I can tell you it's still important to do it on older processors, um, uh, older x86 processors anyway, because um, there's still a penalty even on the older processors. So let's take the 8088, for example. There's a four-byte prefetch queue. 
uh, the 8088 is uh, divided into two halves, a bus interface unit and an execution unit. And the bus interface unit is constantly trying to keep the prefetch queue full, and the execution unit pulls its instructions out of the prefetch queue. Uh, a branch, uh, if taken, empties the prefetch queue. So that's a speed penalty. Again, four bytes is no big deal, but it is a speed penalty. So can you structure your code to do a certain type of thing without using any branches? No go-tos, no you know jump if carry bit set, nothing like that. Uh, and you can. So I've prepared a couple of examples, at least for coding on an old school 8088 processor. And uh, they have uh, trying to do something branchless has advantages and disadvantages. Um, and let's go ahead over to my desktop and uh, I'll show you uh, some of the examples and uh, explain why they might be good or bad for your situation. So let's look at a couple of examples of uh, branchless code for low resource processors. I'm just going to be looking at the x86, uh, you know, the 8086, 8088 style. Um, there are better ways to do branchless code on later processors because they have more instructions and more comparison uh, operators and, and also more operators that can do more in a single instruction, but let's just look at some simple ones for now. So let's start with a typical example of copying memory. Now, if you wanted to simply copy memory, you can use rep move SB and you make sure that the count is in CX, but rep move SB copies byte by byte. So what if you wanted to speed it up by copying uh, two bytes at a time with move SW. Well, you can, and a typical branching way would be something like uh, shifting right, which would divide the count by two, and uh, if it was odd, there uh, a bit will be in carry. Do the copy, and then if no carry bit, which means if the original count was even, just skip copying the odd byte and move on. So there is always a compare and a branch here. So you can make this branchless, with something like this. Go ahead and divide CX uh, by two and put the carry bit in uh, if it's odd. Do your copy and then add if carry. And when this copy is done, CX is zero. Then you can add if the uh, add if carry bit, which means it will add, it will do a regular add, but if the carry bit is set, it will also add the carry bit in. And what this will do is CX will still be zero if it was originally even, but CX will now be one if it is originally odd. And then if that's the case, you can tell it to do this as well, rep move SB. Now, it might, you might be silly to be like, well, if, you, if the count is zero, then why would you repeat a zero count? Well, you can do it. This is only one instruction, one prefix, uh, one byte uh, for the prefix, and then it does nothing if the count was originally even, and it will copy one byte if the count was originally odd. Let's try another typical example, uh, converting a byte value if the value is from 0 to F uh, to its hexadecimal ASCII equivalent to print hex on screen. You first compare it to 10, you know, is it a number? If so, uh, jump to the numbers only handling and adjust it for the start of the ASCII range. However, if it's not a number, you then uh, adjust it for the uh, ASCII character range. So this is fairly simple, but you can do this branchless as well using some additional instructions. Uh, credit goes to Norbert Joe for, uh, for this. You compare it to 10, and then if, uh, as the comments say, if the uh, carry bit is set, this subtract with borrow is going to do two different things it will leave it in a particular range based on whether or not it was 0 through 9 or A through F. And then you can use a BCD opcode. These are uh, opcodes for dealing with numbers in BCD format. BCD format was common uh, on mainframes and it, it's a way of representing numbers um, in decimal as opposed to uh, binary or hexadecimal or some other way that you would be com you know, normally be comfortable with. And this will adjust it. And you can see the end result here will put it in the correct range. Uh, I, however, like to do this, which is also branchless, and it's just a simple lookup table. As I mentioned in a previous video, xlat is one of my favorite instructions. If you simply have a hex table defined somewhere, you can then uh, put the uh, byte in AL, you can point BX to the hexadecimal table, and then run xlat, which will effectively do this. Replace AL with BX plus AL. This is not valid 
uh, in any x86 um, uh, CPU, but xlat makes it work like that. Let's move on to a final example here. Um, saturated subtraction is where you want to subtract something, but as long as you keep subtracting, you never want it to go below zero. So if it hits a negative number, you want it to automatically adjust to zero. So this is good for countdown timers. Uh, so a typical subtraction would be to decrement it, and if the resulting number is not signed, go ahead and continue over here. However, if it is signed, we'll, move, we'll end up here, which will zero it out, clip it to zero. A branchless way of doing this would be something like this, where instead of subtracting, you add negative one, and then you sit, and which will set carry, and then you can subtract with borrow uh, a scratch register, and then the scratch register will become a mask. It will be FFFF if the value was uh, zero and uh, zero, you know, if, if it was above, and it would be the mask will be zero if the value was negative, and then you can use that mask to and the value, and this achieves the same thing, and you've avoided. Uh, a branch. Chris Asik asks, why did the 640k barrier even exist and what were the methods used to exceed it? I'm aware of XMS and EMS, though I've never understood exactly how they work. So, the memory space of the original IBM PC, that is the original 8086 and the 8088, is a, a full addressable space of one meg. So it actually goes past the 640k mark. The only reason there even is a 640k barrier is because of how uh, IBM designed the system. They uh, sort of unofficially um, let the space after 640k be reserved for um, adapter memory space, like ROM space or even adapter RAM. So it's not actually a hard barrier. You can put um, in a system without a VGA card you can put RAM there and you can actually extend DOS into that and then you'll have 7, uh, 704K. Um, in fact, actually you can keep going further. If all you have is a CGA card, you can extend DOS all the way up to 736K. Now, to explain what's going on, it would probably be better to show you a diagram. So let's switch to an overhead view of my work table and I will draw you a diagram of the one meg memory space uh, and uh, let's take it from there. So to illustrate what the 640k barrier is, it would help if we had an illustration of what the DOS memory map actually looks like. So let's just do some quick drawing here. I'm going to uh, draw memory as if it were a linear map and because it is and again, to stress, the original 8088 and 8086 that the PC used could access up to one meg total RAM. It did so through the use of segment registers. And the segment registers, uh, each one was typically in, listed as in thousands. So for example, let's just go a little bit more here. So this segment would be from it would be the, the zero segment this would be segment 1000 this is these numbers are in hex 2000 3000 and so on eight nine and each segment is 64k okay so this is also 64k and so on i won't do the rest and then once you get to nine this is also the 640k mark because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these segments. Now it keeps going. There is segment A thousand, B thousand, C thousand, D thousand, E thousand, and finally at the top we have F thousand. Uh, F thousand, by the way, is where the ROM BIOS lives. Sometimes it lives in uh, F1000, F800, if you have a smaller BIOS, like a 32K BIOS or something, or even FC, FC100, rather. 
and that would be a small 16K BIOS. So here's this mark. Now you may think if you're familiar with VGA programming, well, this makes sense. They stopped it here because A1000 is the beginning of VGA RAM. However, this is arbitrary. When the PC was first designed, VGA didn't exist. In fact, uh, this was used at design for MDA, for monochrome. So these segments above the 640K mark, IBM arbitrarily de uh, designated for RAM adapter space. So we've, we would have video adapters here, C1000 or sometimes C800 is usually used as, excuse me, uh, like a hard drive adapter, um, and so on. So uh, E1000, if you're curious, E1000 is, is most typically used for EMS, typically for the EMS page frame, but EMS didn't exist back then. So why is this some sort of barrier? Well, it isn't really a barrier because if you didn't use VGA at all, this area was still open. And in fact, you can put RAM here and expand. Uh, if you use, uh, let's assume that this is not here. If you put RAM there instead, you've got 640K plus 64K equals 704K. And I have done this on systems. I've put an extra, I've systems that are, that are CGA that don't have a VGA card in them. You can map RAM there, and now you've got 704K in DOS. So it isn't an actual barrier. It was just sort of uh, there by opportunity, by circumstance. You can even, if you have CGA only and not MDA, you can actually uh, go all the way up into here. So no VGA card and no monochrome card means you, this is 96K of information that you can add. So this 640K actually now becomes 736K. I have done that also on systems that are CGA only. So my point is that the, the 640K barrier wasn't a hard barrier. It was just the logical stopping of RAM. Um, most systems would go up to 640K and stop because again, IBM's semi-official recommendation is that anything above, uh, anything from 8,000 and higher would be used for adapter RAM, but it, there was nothing preventing you from actually putting stuff there and also using it as RAM. So, the 640K barrier was um, a product of the time in which RAM was expensive. You know, when the PC came out, uh, it was just this much, 16 to 64K on the motherboard. And later systems would use uh, 256K, and then finally 64, uh, sorry, 640, and uh, there was really no reason to go beyond that because certainly up until, up until 1987 or 19. Uh, 88, unless you were running uh, spreadsheets that threatened to overflow all of your RAM, you didn't need more. So it was just sort of this accidental thing. Now, you also mentioned what is the deal with EMS and XMS. Um, XMS is simply uh, any RAM above the one meg mark. This is where XMS lives. And the only way to deal, uh, the only way to access XMS is through an AT or later, a 286 or later. And XMS is managed extended memory above the one meg mark uh, that the 286 can access by going into and out of protected mode. And uh, you'll, you're familiar with HiMem.sys. HiMem is the device driver that turns everything above one meg into XMS memory. Um, that's XMS. Now, for people who didn't have 286s, there was something called EMS. And you'll remember that I mentioned uh, this is the typical location of the EMS page frame. So what is EMS? EMS is page memory. It was a specification uh, that came up uh, for, by Lotus, Intel, and Microsoft to try to fit, honest, I'm not kidding, this is why Lotus is part of the, the specification, fit bigger spreadsheets in memory. Now for systems that could not expand up to one meg and later, 
how could you do that? How could you add more RAM in here? Well, the answer was to have a paged window of RAM. So 64K, roughly, um, it could actually be as little as 16K, but most page frame, you would create something called a page frame, which was 64K and usually took over an entire segment, and it could page in and out of RAM located on a board, wherever that RAM was. And so uh, the EMS standard was a set of commands you could send to um, a device driver uh, through a common, well-established, known, documented interface, and you could get the contents of this window to change instantly to any 16K page uh, to, f to up, up to 64, so, okay, each page in EMS is 16K. Four of them make up a page frame, 64K. You can issue a command to EMS and instantaneously this, the contents of this window change to the pages that you asked for. So this is what EMS is, and this is how 8088s and 8086s could access more than 640K or one meg total. So I hope that answers your question. I hope it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not terribly simple. Um, later on with 386s, you had the ability to run EMS emulators at the same time as XMS. This, is a comp this isn't complicated, but it does complicate this discussion, so I'm not going to mention that here. But if you have further questions, uh, please feel free to uh, leave a note in the comments, and I will try to expand as best I can. Carlos Texiera says, Tandy 1000s, how many of them do you own, and which specific model do you prefer? Uh, before I tell you how many I own, uh, I'll tell you that the one I prefer is unfortunately not actually in my collection. I think the, uh, the one I prefer the most is the Tandy TL3, which is a 286, and it also has DOS in ROM, and I think DOS in ROM is the coolest thing. I used to have a TL2. Um, I don't know uh, what happened to it. I think I either donated it to... I think I donated it to someone who, who had no Tandys and really wanted one. Um, and it has DOS and ROM, and what's cool is that you power it on, and in three seconds you're at a DOS prompt. It's like instant on. And if you're programming on it and you crash the computer, you just hit the little red reset button on the front, and then in three seconds, poof, you're back at the DOS prompt, and you can just keep working. I think that's cool. Um, so that would be my preferred one. Um, however, when it comes to uh, how many Tandys I actually own, I actually don't know. So I'm going to take the camera off the tripod here and go searching around the various nooks and crannies of my basement, and we're going to see exactly what I do have. So although a lot of my hardware is organized somewhat in racks, um, the Tandy stuff is also in racks and all over the place, but it is not organized. So let's see what I can locate. Uh, first off, we have a Tandy 1000 EX. And uh, this does have the uh, memory upgrade in it, so it does a full 640. Here's three more. This is a Tandy TX. This is a Tandy 1000. Just to be sure, it's the 1000 and not the HD. Let's double check. It is, it's the original Tandy 1000. Uh, this is, in fact, the, uh, the one that's been in the family the longest. Um, it was my father-in-law's, and he used it so much on so many hot days that the monitor feet burnt their way into the plastic. This is not something I can scrape off. The plastic has actually been deformed. It has a 20 megabyte hard drive card in it, and then this is a Tandy 1000 uh, HD proper. Now, that's all I have in this room. Uh, let's go double check what I have in the crawl space, where I have more units in the crawl space. Probably wouldn't hurt to mention that I have some uh, Tandy original monitors as well. So there's one, and there's the other. Here is a third Tandy 1000 TX. Might be wondering why I have three TXs. Well, I think TXs are a really great a blend of what makes Tandys unique. They have the 16 color graphics and the three voice sound, but because they're an eight megahertz 286, they have the additional power required to move around 
that 16 color graphics, it's twice the video memory to sling around. So any action game that supports Tandy graphics is actually enjoyable on a Tandy TX. Now looking around, I think I've got one more. Let's go take a look. Sure enough, knew I had at least one more here. This is a 1000 RLX. And it works perfectly, except the floppy drive has some issues. And uh, trying to repair one of those is frustrating because the hard drives don't use the same uh, connections. The power is through the floppy cable. So it's a pain in the ass to try to wire up a new cable. So yeah, there's uh, the Tandy systems I have. I used to have more, uh, but I sold or, or gave them away to people who were more needy than me. Pietro Caruso asks many questions. Let's take these one at a time. Do you have any plans to make any DOS games in the near future? Yes, but, um, and in fact, I'm working with uh, an, another person to explore some ideas on what is possible and what kind of a game we would want to make. And I'm also working with someone else on uh, testing uh, a sound library that he's written that I think is going to be somewhat revolutionary for the 8088 space. Uh, so uh, watch this space uh, for more information. However, there's a lot of videos that I want to make first. Um, I'm working on something that would greatly benefit um, the software collecting community, and I'm also working on a video that would be of interest to Apple II owners, and I'd like to get those done before I start trying to do something like work on a game. What do you think about 3D6 assembly? Uh, I love the extra segment registers for the programmer. Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the question, what do I think about 3D6 assembly? I like 3D6 assembly, I guess. Um, uh, I mean, I used to program uh, on then current CPUs all the way up to the Pentium. Um, my last uh, demo scene production in the 1990s uh, had motion blur that was optimized for, a, for the two pipeline uh, original Pentium, the U and the V pipes. And uh, that was fun and I enjoyed it. And yes, it's nice having two extra segment registers and 32-bit registers and a flat memory space and memory protection and all that other fun stuff. Now, if I say this, you might think, well, if I do like it, why do I arbitrarily limit myself to that guy back there? Um, because it's more fun to be limited, if that makes any sense. There's a really great quote about art, um, and I don't know who said it, but it's that art breaks through its medium. Meaning, sometimes the more limited your medium is, the more amazing the art is that can come out it or through it. Uh, and that's how I feel about uh, demo coding and other kinds of coding on the original PC. Uh, I find it refreshing. What's the coolest 8088 clone? The coolest? Um, that, I mean, it depends on what your definition of cool is. Uh, I can name a few off the bat. I think the, uh, the Panasonic Senior Partner is a hilarious uh, 8088 clone because it is a luggable, but it also has a built-in printer. So you are lugging around a keyboard, a monitor, uh, and a printer in the same luggable handle case. Um, and what's even more hilarious is that the printer, uh, they wanted the paper to be portable as well, so it uses um, fax paper on a roller. So you're printing on fax paper, and it's, so it's a thermal printer. Um, and that is simultaneously horrifying and hilarious, and uh, I love it. Um, in terms of other cool clones, I mean, I think no one would dispute the fact that the, the Tandy 1000 is is a really cool clone because it was PC compatible plus had the extra sound and graphics and pretty much uh, you know saved Sierra from uh, bankruptcy um, so there's two things right off the bat I mean I don't know it really depends on what your definition of cool is uh, the uh, HP palm top series like the um, what is it, the LX100 and LX200? I think I have those model numbers, right? I mean, those are 8088s you can hold in the palm of your hand. And uh, they start up with organizer software, like a calendar and a notebook and contacts and addresses and things like that. They start up with that in ROM, but it's a full-blown, you know, P 
PC compatible system and it runs off of batteries and it fits in your pocket. So that's pretty cool. What do you think about the usage of modern development tools and compilers on DOS? Again, I'm not totally sure what you mean about what I think about them. I mean, I think any development for DOS is great, and it doesn't matter what tools you, you use to achieve that. Uh, I'm an old school guy. I like to code directly on the system. Um, there's several reasons for that. Um, I feel like the IBM Model F keyboard, the original 8080 key keyboard, is one of the best keyboards ever made, so that helps. I do have uh, a model uh, M13 right below me here, and that's my main daily driver. But you know, sometimes I just think it's great to be on the original system. And when you're on the original system, you have to use the old tools. But it takes a long time to compile and assemble on an old system, so there's certainly nothing wrong with using new stuff. Uh, 88 miles per hour was a combination of old tools: Turbo Pascal, Turbo Assembler, um, Turbo Debugger and a combination of new tools such as uh, NASM and actually YASM was the preferred assembler for cross development and um, also um, Open Watcom. Uh, Open Watcom can produce 16-bit C.com executables and so we use that as well for the uh, for the 3D part so um, I don't care what tools you use modern or otherwise I just want people to make more DOS games V Westlife asks, on paper, the IBM PC, Apple II, and TRS-80 sound outputs are all very similar. So how come Apple II and TRS-80 games were able to do polyphonic in-game music while the PC speaker couldn't? For example, pick a dilly pair on the Apple II. So them's fighting words. Um, so it, the PC could do that, but it didn't. Before we go into why, uh, let's take a look at uh, what V Westlife is talking about. Um, he talks about uh, polyphonic music in the background. Um, so let's take a, a look at Piccadilly Pair, which illustrates exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> Okay, so what did we just see? Um, the Apple II was producing polyphonic music by uh, setting uh, a certain frequency for each voice and then having in-memory counters that counted down until the frequency would change. And then every time a counter counts down, it toggles the speaker. This is a very CPU intensive thing. And uh, when it's producing polyphonic music in this way, um, the computer is doing only that. So nothing else is happening. So your next question is, well, how was, how was it animating the graphics while it was doing the sound? Well, it took very little time to update those graphics. So what it was really doing was updating the graphics, playing a chord, then updating the graphics, then playing the chord. The playing the chord is like 95 to 98% of the time that that you were seeing in that video and flipping the graphics was like a super quick operation if you were to take the audio from that video and look at it in a waveform monitor you'd see silence when it's updating the graphics it just looks like it's background the whole thing that of what we just saw was actually very much a foreground thing so could the pc do this yes it could uh here's a very quick snippet of um winter olympiad from tiny soft <laughs> And here's a very quick snippet of uh, 007, License to Kill. That one's better. Uh, and here's a snippet of music from Turbo Outrun. So if the PC could produce that kind of polyphonic music, how come it wasn't doing it and then quickly updating a graphic and doing it again um, in early PC games? I think a couple of reasons, um, and this is just conjecture, but um, I think it's accurate based on what I remember and what I know of programming the system. Uh, first of all, any game programmer sitting down at an IBM PC 
is going to immediately note that they can do something that the Apple and the Tandy couldn't do, uh, with the TRS-80 couldn't do, which is produce a single square wave tone completely without using the CPU. The timer can keep a square wave tone going, and it's completely in the background, no CPU involvement at all. So if you have that available to you, you would probably just go with that. Um, you just create running background music throughout, uh, throughout the game and without any CPU involvement. Um, the second reason, I think, is that um, on the Apple II, at least, there are two graphics pages. So, and, and there's also less memory to sling around. So updating the graphics is, is faster, or at least certainly cleaner. Uh, like if you needed to flip a page or something uh, as the break in between the polyphonic music playing, you know, that's, that's instantaneous. Um, on the PC, it t there was more video memory involved for graphics, and so you know you would actually see the thing paint as it updated if it was a larger update, and so the pauses between the polyphonic music sections sections would be bigger, so that might be another reason. That's a long answer. I hope it answered your question, um, but you know you're right. It seems like this kind of polyphonic music and and screen updating thing. I never saw really on the Apple II past 84, 85, and that's kind of where the PC was just starting to ramp up in terms of graphics, in, in terms of gameplay, rather. Um, so, you know, who knows? Maybe it was just uh, an overlap of years and opportunity. I don't know. But, um, but it could do it. It just didn't. So that's the answer. Hey, it's Joe from Joe's Computer Museum. He asks, ever have any experience with microchannel architecture boards? And if so, what can you tell us about the experience? I have very little experience with microchannel architecture by choice. Um, they, I didn't have much opportunity to mess with them because they were always way too expensive. And as a vintage collector and restorer today, I could get my hands on a, quite a bit of microchannel architecture because just like everything IBM made, it all still works. They made that stuff out of steel and who knows what else, but everything IBM made is still functioning. But I won't touch them with a 10-foot pole, and the reason is that um, it is nearly impossible to find um, parts for them, uh, especially add-in cards because, you know, for every... 2,000 ISA cards produced, one microchannel board was produced. Um, secondly, even if you do find the hardware, this is sometimes a problem that vintage computer collectors have, even if you find the hardware, you may not find the software, and um, you needed the software for microchannel boards. Um, I'm not an expert in microchannel, but I have distinct memories of needing a floppy disk that had a, not, not even a driver, just a definition of what the hardware was uh, and what addresses it could uh, interact with and what resources it needed and things like that. And without that disk, you couldn't use the hardware. So, uh, and it's very common in the hobby to find hardware without software and vice versa. So, um, so as, as bulletproof as those systems are, I don't, I just pass them by. Um, there are a few diehard microchannel collectors, and there's a couple of really great informational resources uh, on the web. I will put links in the video description about microchannel architecture, but um, you won't find any in my collection. The only PS2 systems I have in my collection are the ISA ones. I have uh, a, a couple of Model 25s, uh, which are the monitor all built into one, hey look, we're not a Mac uh, systems. Uh, and I also have a PS2 Model 30-286, um, which is just a nice slim profile system to have. It's nice to have uh, a faster 286 to run stuff on. Uh, and it was also the uh, personal system of uh, my oldest friend who had one growing up and I would go to his place and play games on it and stuff. So uh, he donated all of his games to me 20 years ago and then 10 years ago I got the exact system they ran on as well. So. Uh, I don't normally collect for nostalgia, but my PS2 Model 30 286 was definitely a nostalgia purchase. Hot Plug Surprise asks, Tell me more about mostly compatible DOS systems. What are the most common or interesting incompatibilities? So, the majority of incompatibilities that I have found in mostly compatible systems has to do with the uh, location of video memory. So, 
The uh, Corona and Tandy 1000 systems have, uh, they don't have dedicated video memory, they use system RAM as video RAM. And it's always at the end of available RAM. So if a, a large program, too large for the system, tries to load, uh, it can load into the end part, which is being used for video RAM. And uh, so two things happen. First, you'll see the screen get completely corrupted as uh, the program loads into it. And then the program corrupts itself because it's changing stuff on the screen, which is really changing it in the program. <laughs> and it conveniently uh, blows its brains out. Um, so that's interesting. The PC Junior suffers from a similar problem, at least on the 128K. Uh, systems uh, and the Tandy 2000, uh, which was never really marketed as a PC compatible, but definitely an MS DOS compatible system. Uh, the Tandy 2000 um, is an interesting system. It actually runs an 8186 processor, and it has its video memory in a completely different location. You know, color video RAM uh, is normally at B800 uh, segment, and uh, I don't know where it is in the Tandy 2000, but it isn't at B800. So if you try to write directly to video RAM there, like nothing happens. Um, someone wrote a, a TSR for the Tandy 2000 that will periodically refresh wherever the video RAM actually is from the contents at B800 for programs that, that don't use the BIOS. But um, I don't know if I'd necessarily call those interesting, but I think that's the most common incompatibility. The Olivetti M24, which I've mentioned uh, before, I think many times uh, on this series of videos, as the uh, AT&T 6300, the USA OEM version of that system. Um, the Olivetti has two interesting incompatibilities. One is that the uh, bus will inadvertently swap the high byte and the low byte on a 16-bit read or write. So it's not a memory read or write, but a 16-bit read or write from a port. Uh, in assembly, this would look like in AX, comma, DX. Uh, and it would be out DX, comma, AX. Um, when you do that, the high byte and the low byte get swapped. Uh, they offered later a bus correction kit that the user could uh, install in the field to try to fix that. Uh, but most people don't have that kit. So unfortunately, that prevents some network cards from working. The Intel Ether Express. Uh, is a card that I've hoarded uh, a little bit because it works in almost everything, but I can't use one in an M24 because um, it only uses a memory window on 286s and later. On the 8088 and 8086 systems, it only uses port writes and it only does 16-bit port writes, and so the data comes back scrambled and I can't use that card. Uh, the other incompatibility that the M24 has is that the floppy controller is not a true NEC765 chipset. So it mostly works. Occasionally a copy protected program will not run on the 6300. Uh, sometimes that also has to do with the speed. The 6300 is a, uh, and the Olivetti M24, is a 8 MHz 8086 timing, that that's extra speed uh, can also mess up the timing of some copy protection routines, but most of the time it's the floppy controller. And uh, unfortunately that means you can also never run uh, image disk on uh, an Olivetti M24 because image disk talks directly to what it thinks is an NEC765 chip. So uh, yeah, so that's unfortunate. Those are about the only weird things that I've seen. and. Uh, if it was any more, if you ever had a system that was any more incompatible, then it would be unusable, at least for PC uh, software that used, that tried to do things without using the BIOS. A lot of early clones were marketed as MS-DOS computers and not necessarily IBM PC computers. And it's kind of funny to read their advertising because they'll have wording like, runs most of the popular software. <laughs> and you're like, well, I want it to run all of the software, popular or not. Um, I think the, I want to say maybe the Hyperion or uh, maybe the Eagle might have been semi-compatible. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I do know that K-Pro had a, a, a system. Was it K-Pro? They had a system that was based on the 8086, and they said you could run either CPM or MS-DOS on it. 
So you'd think, great, I can run both of those and I can run my PC software on it. Nope. When they said MS-DOS, they really did mean MS-DOS. It had no IBM BIOS in it. So you could run a program that was a DOS executable, COM or EXE, and as long as it used only DOS functions to output strings and take in input from the keyboard, and hardly, no, and hardly any programs did this, um, then it would run. Um, and you can imagine how well that went over. Um, MS-DOS only compatibles was a thing from like 81 to 83, and they weren't made after that. Distwave asks, do you have any experience with CPU upgrade products like the Intel inboard 386 or 286 to 486 upgrades like Make It 486 or the Kingston SLC now? Why do you think they're so rare and expensive nowadays? Uh, that's a cool and interesting question. Um, as to why they're rare these days, I think it's because um, a lot of them were really kind of fool's gold. Uh, they did speed up the system, but unless it was a chip replacement like the Make It 486 that you mentioned, um, the speed up was never as good as the actual system built around the chip. Um, you can put an Intel inboard 3D6 in that guy back there and what you get is something that isn't the speed of a 16 megahertz 3D6, which is the chip on it. You, the overall speed you get, because everything still has to go through the older 8-bit uh, bus, um, is roughly around the speed of an IBM AT. So it's like you gotta go double to get somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's why I think they're rare necessarily, because uh, I don't think a lot of people really use them. Um, uh, and certainly when, I think another reason they're rare is because that when people got rid of their systems, they usually would sell, donate, or chuck the entire system with the upgrade still installed in it. Um, I have not used CPU chip uh, upgrades. I have, however, used a lot of uh, boards. And in fact, this is the subject of yet another video that I uh, am working on and have partially scripted, um, speed up boards. And uh, I actually have uh, four that I can show you. So let's once again take the camera off the tripod, go to my overhead view, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, show you what I've got. So I'd like to briefly show you some of the acceleration products that I've managed to collect over the years, and I hope to do a video specifically on these someday. Um, but I wanted to start with an interesting uh, product that wasn't actually a CPU speed-up product. Now, if it wasn't a CPU speed-up product, how did it work? Well, it was specifically for the IBM AT, and you'll notice the name of it says so, the AT Turbo Switch. And what the Turbo Switch is, is uh, a replacement crystal. Let's see if we can get a view of the crystal here. Uh, a replacement crystal. Uh, with taps to connect it to various places on the motherboard and then on the outside of the system uh, a toggle switch reset button and configurable speed dial so you could uh, take your 6 megahertz 286 and uh, reclock it all the way up to 12 megahertz although the manual uh, and other reviews of the time are quick to state that not all systems will go all the way up to 12 megahertz so this is an interesting product that didn't actually use a CPU. It used your own CPU and just had a replacement clock crystal. Um, interesting note, the IBM AT had uh, their latest BIOS, their, their third and final revision of the BIOS, uh, tried to prevent products like that from working. But that's not typical. What most people think of when they uh, talk about an accelerator product is something like this, the Tiny Turbo 286. So, these products uh, have an actual 286 on board. Let's see if I can very carefully show you uh, the board here without damaging anything. They have a 286 on board and then they have a ribbon socket that go to the 8088. And so that is how uh, they function. You can boot up by, in either 8088 mode uh, or in accelerated mode using the 286. Um, the, you couldn't toggle on the fly with most of these products. You usually had to power off and then toggle the switch and uh, come back. Here's another one, the Soda 286. Let's 
see if we can get a good view of this one. Uh, also uses a 286, of course, and uh, here you can see the, uh, the old 8086 that was stuck into it from the old system. And uh, that is an 8086, isn't it? Yes. And uh, same thing, you have a toggle switch right here for booting up in different modes. And then here's an interesting one that did not use a 286. This is the AST Flash Pack. The Flash Pack is interesting in that it includes an NEC V30 to replace an 8086 or an 8088, which I also found interesting. Now you might think an NEC V20 is, uh, or V30 rather, is not that much of an upgrade because uh, you can do that in your own system. So why was this considered an acceleration product? Well, that's because it contains 8K of cache and that alone would allow the CPU to run at nearly full speed, assuming of course the, the program fit entirely in the cache. And even if it didn't, uh, the cache would certainly help. So that's an interesting product. It's a slower CPU, but it has 8K cache. And then finally, of course, what most people would really want for their 8088 system would be uh, the Intel uh, 386 accelerator product. This is uh, pretty beefy, and uh, it does not allow for the use of the older CPU. It, you'll notice that there's no toggle switch here and there's no place on the board to put in your old CPU. So this was a fairly substantial upgrade. So you'd think with a 16 megahertz 386 that would really speed up a system. Um, but unfortunately it did not and that's because uh, although the CPU was fast it had to integrate with the rest of the system through the regular 8-bit ISA bus. So what you ended up getting for most of these products was somewhere halfway between the, where you started and where the Accelerator product's CPU actually ran at. Cameron Brett asks, if you had to pick a year to both play DOS games in and use period correct parts from, which year would you choose and why? So I think what this question is actually asking is, what's my favorite DOS game era? Because that would kind of dictate what I pick. Is it you know, 81 to 85, where it was all action games that only worked on a PC? Uh, or is it 85 to, let's say, 89, which was EGA and Tandy and adventure games? Or was it like 90 through the end of the decade, which is, you know, VGA, Sound Blaster? Um, I like them all. I can't really... I mean, I, you know what I, I mostly tend to focus on, but I do really like them all. I was playing all DOS games throughout DOS's life. So I think I'd have to pick, and this may surprise you, uh, my old Pentium 1. I had a Pentium 1, 120, or I had, I still have it, uh, a Pentium 120 or 133 so that I could put a Sound Blaster, a General MIDI Wavetable, and a Gravis Ultrasound in it. And I used to do that and have the output of one routed to the input of the other, and then that one could also output. Uh, and add, and then I could play nearly, nearly any, reasonably, nearly any speed DOS game that ever came out. Um, that system played Quake fairly well at 32200. Um, not fairly well, played it really well actually at 32200. Um, and uh, add a CD-ROM disk changer, I had, still have, a three disk CD-ROM changer in that system, which I loved because if you had a multi-disc game that could support multiple drives, you could use it. I remember using that changer with Under a Killing Moon. Unfortunately, one of the problems with using a three disk changer with Under a Killing Moon is that Under a Killing Moon is four disks. So you could tell it you only had three, and then at some point it would ask you to switch disks anyway, which seemed to defeat the point. But um, yeah, probably a Pentium, full full VGA, full speed, the whole thing. I don't think I'd go much faster than that because even games that were built for taking advantage of faster speeds, like Quake, um, not necessarily Quake, but some some games uh, do bug out if you get too crazy crazy fast on them. Like if you're rendering a frame, well actually this was documented in one of the previous old school videos, uh, Quake actually does bug out 
a little bit if you run it on a system that is so fast that it can render a frame in under a 70th of a second. So, Pentium 133. David Glover Aoki, hope I said that right, says, uh, a related question, was there ever a good reason to preferentially run PC or DR-DOS over MS-DOS, and did that change over time? The competitors to MS-DOS, uh, past version 4, were all different, essentially, not necessarily in terms of core capabilities, but simply features and tools and utilities. So PC-DOS 5 versus DR-DOS 5 versus MS-DOS 5, they're all going to run your programs. They all have memory management, but the, you know, the, the, the tools that they came with were different, and sometimes that could influence your decision. Um, you know, disk compression, MS-DOS had drive space, DR-DOS came with Superstore, PC-DOS 7, and later came with Stacker. Um, if that was important to you, PC-DOS was the best one because Stacker was the best compression product. There was nothing really wrong with double space or drive space. It's just that Stacker was the most refined. They were the first disk compression product to become mainstream uh, and have a lot of support. And so if that was important, you would go with PC-DOS 7. Um, they all have memory management. Uh, MS-DOS 6 and later had MemMaker. DR-DOS had Memory Max, uh, PC-DOS 7 and later came with RAM Boost. Um, again, whichever one you wanted. Uh, I didn't use any of them. I've been using QAMM as long as I can remember, uh, which is the superior product from all of them. So I guess if memory management is your concern, it doesn't matter which DOS you run. That's really it. And, and at the time, uh, it could come down to being as simple as reading the back of the box and seeing, you know, oh, that's cool. I could do that. The, the draw and the appeal of these things is that if the, the third-party DOSes had enough cool stuff, you didn't need to go out and buy Norton Utilities or Mace Utilities or, um, you know, Fastback like, or, or a, a Norton Backup or some other Central Point Backup, some, some Central Point Utilities. You didn't need those. They were built in. Were they as good as the full-featured products? No, but if they did enough, then that was enough. Um, I think you don't need to worry about that these days. I think it's kind of neat to boot up DR-DOS. I personally run PC-DOS 2000, which is a slightly later version of uh, PC-DOS 7. Uh, I do that because um, PC-DOS 7 gives you the most free RAM out of any DOS since MS-DOS 5. Um, but it doesn't really matter run what feels comfortable to you. Uh, I know in the vintage PC uh, community, pretty much the only DOS anyone installs is either MS-DOS 622, because that's what they're familiar with, or uh, MS-DOS uh, 7, which isn't really a standalone version of DOS, it's the, it's the underlying DOS that ran Windows 95 and later. And the reason people use that is because it has built-in support for FAT32, so you can use larger drives with it. I don't use that at all because long file name support and uh, FAT32 support don't really mean much if I'm running pure DOS stuff. It's all going to have 8.3 file names. And how much can you really pack onto a 64 gig drive or something? Um, the second reason, too, is that you can't use disk repair, practically any disk repair utilities with FAT32 file systems that have, you know, that are, I mean, you can, you can boot into Windows or something and use, you know, a more sophisticated utility, but in DOS, you can't run like, you know, you could run like Check Disk and that's it. You can't run like Norton Disk Doctor or some other complicated thing. You can't defrag, there are no DOS tools really that support FAT32. So that's why I don't uh, use um, MS-DOS 7 and later, but uh, it's up to you. You know, um, install System Commander, and then install all the DOSes in the same partition, and boot whichever one appeals to you. So, at the beginning of the video, I promised you uh, an announcement at the end of the video of uh, the future of the channel and the future of these videos and things like that. Um, I uh, have to change uh, how I'm working. I love that you guys ask me questions, and I love answering them. But as you can tell from 
the production quality of this video, which has uh, a cutaway to my workbench not once but twice, um, a listing of code that I wrote for you to illustrate branchless uh, coding, and a tour of portions of my basement to see what I have, these quick videos uh, take me at least eight hours. And that's nobody's fault but my own. I mean, I suppose I could use my cell phone camera and just quickly read stuff off a monitor and then, you know, not research anything and just spout words at you. But I feel like um, I am I am bound a bit by the demo scene credo, which is if you're not going to do it better, then why do it at all? That's a double-edged sword. I recognize that. I think it's a funny statement. Uh, I like it though. It appeals to me, um, and I feel like if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. So uh, the monthly Q and A videos will drop down to be either quarterly or three times a year or twice a year and I'm going to put the time I would normally spend into the monthly Q&A videos into the long-form research videos um, that I think I'm known for and that I think people would really rather see from me. Um, at least I would rather see them from me. So uh, this will be the last Q&A video for a while uh, and you may also see me drop off online from time to time, uh, as unfortunately I have non-COVID-19 health issues that I need to resolve. Uh, they don't affect the production of the videos that I'm working on necessarily, but um, being online and being available uh, does affect them. So you may see that happen, but don't worry, I'm still here. Uh, you could certainly always send me a PM, and when I'm online, I will find it. You can certainly always email me as well, uh, and if you can figure out how to email me, then uh, uh, I deserve to read your email. Uh, so you can contact me that way. Uh, and so until then, until the next video comes out, which should hopefully be in about four weeks, um, I appreciate your, your time and your continued patience with my uh, release schedule. So. Uh, uh, as I think I said before, um, be safe, be well, and I will see you later.